Okay, I think we are ready to start again. Um, in the second part of my presentation, I will talk about signal enhancement algorithms, uh, noise reduction, single channel um, noise reduction, but also multi-channel, and specifically also a dual channel approach that will be then important for the hands-on session uh, later in the afternoon. Um, okay, so um, we have gone through some uh, introductory slides um, in the morning and um, I pointed out um, that um, the performance in adverse acoustic conditions is very important um, and uh, in fact users spend a lot of money on these devices and they expect um, more or less effortless communication, also in complex acoustic environments. Um, that means with many spatially distributed, possibly moving sources, um, the signals that we have to deal with are all non-stationary. Um, they are also non-Gaussian. Um, they're composed of noise and reverberation. Um, in the acoustic space, you have very long impulse responses. Um, and time-varying impulse responses. So, in short, it's really an estimation theoretic nightmare, or it's not what you find in the books. In the books, it's Gaussian stationary um, and uh, time invariant. And in acoustics, it's, um, it's uh, opposite in all these uh, aspects. Okay, so effortless communication means that you need both a high intelligibility but also high signal quality. Uh, imagine the people, users, are listening to your processed signals 40, 80, 18, 14 or 18 hours a day. And so if there are artifacts in the signal, it becomes um, annoying um, very soon. Um, and also we talked about Restrictions, especially um, restrictions in terms of hardware, very small size of device, the devices. Um, you need a very low power consumption, so typically in the order of one uh, milliwatt, um, and um, very low processing delay. I said typically below 10 milliseconds. So whenever you process your signal, you read in, say, 10 milliseconds of your signal, you have to make all the decisions in that time, whether it's speech or noise, whether to amplify or not amplify, um, that all needs to be done on um, 10 milliseconds. You cannot just read in one minute of the conversation, process it, and uh, stream it out again. That would not work in a conversation context. Okay, so the objectives for speech enhancement are uh, manifold. Um, we, of course, want to get rid of the noise, uh, want to have a low output noise level, um, but at the same time, we want to have a high-quality target signal, a natural-sounding target signal. We want to have also a signal of high intelligibility. Um, we want to have also low background noise distortions. That's by the same argument, uh, for the most part, um, people are listening to the background and not to the target because they are not always in the conversation. So uh, for extended periods of the daily use time, they're just listening to background. And so also the background noise needs to have a very natural quality um, and um, make sense to um, the users. And also, if you think of binaural um, systems, uh, you want to have also high consistency of the spatial image, um, localization capabilities, and so on. Um, so clearly that's a difficult optimization problem and, uh, of course, hearing abilities of the listeners must be taken into account. So I will start with a single channel noise reduction and you may ask why single channel? Nowadays we have microphone arrays and a um, lot more fancy and uh, powerful. Um, well, if you look at the size of the devices again, um, the devices that the users really like to have and to wear uh, are the very small ones, like in the ear canal, the almost invisible ones, and there's um, room for only one microphone. Um, the thing, it will be a bit relaxed when you have the binaural link, so you can use the microphone from the left and the right side um, to combine it, um, but 
define the audio signals, but um, if you just look at one device, um, for the very small ones, you have just one microphone, and this is it. So here, um, we look at a typical block diagram of um, a single channel noise reduction algorithm where we have the incoming signal Y of K here in the time domain. Then we do a segmentation with some sort of windows. We have looked at this already, the DFT, and um, then we have here the complex Fourier coefficients. Um, then we do some noise reduction processing on these complex coefficients. We get the estimated clean speech coefficients here at this point. Mu is the frequency bin, and L is the um, frame index or time index here. Um, then we do an inverse DFT, and we use the overlap add procedure to generate a continuous um, output signal. So in the DFT domain, we have complex coefficients, and um, if the noise is additive, also in the DFT domain, in the complex DFT domain, um, the target signal S and the noise signal N are additive. Um, yeah, and task, the task is, uh, given these noisy DFT coefficients, estimate or find some function um, to estimate uh, the clean speech coefficients. That's the task. Now let's zoom into this yellow box, um, this uh, noise reduction box, and typically you find uh, three components in this box. So here again is the DFT. Now we look at just at one DFT bin. So here are the noisy DFT coefficients. And this block is this estimator that takes the uh, noisy DFT coefficients and uh, computes um, clean speech coefficients. And in order to do so, most of these methods require that um, you have some knowledge about the SNR, the local SNR in each time frequency point. Um, so this is an um, SNR estimator that works in each frequency bin and estimates the SNR also uh, adaptively over time. And for the SNR, you need a noise power estimator that tells you of uh, um, the noise level in each frequency bin and also time varying noise levels um, over time. So we have here already some important quantities that you find very often mentioned in papers of sp about speech enhancement. Um, the C of mu and L um, is called the a priori SNR. So the SNR, I will have another slide on this, but the SNR that is more or less um, given or assumed. And um, gamma uh, mu of L is the a posteriori SNR. I have also a slide on this to explain this. I want to continue with first an illustration of how more or less all these algorithms work. So here is uh, the short time spectrum of a noisy speech sound. Again, there's the vowel. You can clearly see the harmonics here in a frequency range from 0 to 4 kilohertz. And um, we see here the power, um, the short time power of this uh, speech sound. And um, in red is now the estimated noise power uh, shown here. And what all these algorithms do in one or another way is now to evaluate the signal-to-noise ratio locally in each frequency bin. So, for example, here at this first harmonic, you have a fairly high signal-to-noise ratio because the noise level is here and the signal level is here. So, essentially, um, the algorithms should not modify this, these frequency bins because they are have a high signal-to-noise ratio, while in between these harmonics, um, the signal-to-noise ratio is relatively low, so zero to B or below. And um, so these are clearly bins where not a lot of speech information can be recovered, or there is even no speech uh, information. And these bins should be attenuated. And that's shown in the next step, um, the enhanced spectrum. So by uh, computing these estimators, we indeed get a reproduction of the uh, harmonics of the signal. They are not changed or only changed just a little bit, uh, while in between the harmonics, we attenuate the signal. And uh, now if you resynthesize this um, frame or segment of speech into the time domain, then you have the appearance that you have um, less noise in the signal than you had before. Um, also, you can see that by applying just a gain, as we do it here, um, you cannot um, 
improve the local SNR in the frequency bin. That's not possible because you just apply a weight, and the weight scales the target and the noise alike. Um, but the noise reduction effect uh, um, comes into play when you have different bins, one with a lot of speech, one with a lot of noise, and then you can attenuate those with the noise and leave those with the speech um, unmodified. Okay, so there are now a lot of different uh, methods and rules how to compute this weighting. The most well-known and prominent one is the Wiener filter. Uh, that's the linear estimator. But there are also many popular nonlinear estimators. Estimators, for example, that focus on the spectral amplitude instead of on the complex Fourier coefficients. Uh, log spectral amplitude. They, some have psychoacoustically motivated models to compute this weighting where masking, uh, spectral or simultaneous masking in the ear is considered as well. And there are all kinds of uh, variants um, of these uh, methods. And I will introduce a few of them. Um, firstly, uh, the Wiener filter, which is a linear filter. So the uh, noisy input signal, YFK, composed of the clean speech and the noise, um, is... Um, uh, fed through this uh, Wiener filter with uh, impulse response H of K, and the output is the estimated speech signal. And um, the Wiener filter now minimizes the mean square error between um, a desired signal and the output signal. The desired signal is, um, mo uh, in most cases, the clean signal. So in a way, for computing the filter, we need to assume that we have the clean signal, but only for the computation. Um, so here is a mean square error, and that's minimized, and that's typically done then in the frequency domain. And this leads to the following gain function. So this is the, um, the frequency response of the Wiener filter, where here you have the power spectral density of the clean speech signal. Um, and in the uh, denominator, you have the sum of the power spectral densities of clean speech and noise. Um, so that can be then rewritten by dividing the numerator and denominator by phi and n. Then you get signal-to-noise ratios in the numerator. So if you divide the numerator by phi and n and the uh, denominator, then you can um, rewrite this as uh, xi over 1 plus xi. And xi is now the signal-to-noise ratio. And now you can clearly see how this works. Whenever you have a high signal-to-noise ratio, you can um, uh, omit the, the one here, and then this will converge towards one, um, the gain function, or this frequency response. And whenever the signal-to-noise ratio is low, then the numerator goes to zero, and um, um, the gain goes to zero as well. And that's shown here in this plot. Um, so here's this a priori SNR, which is a xi here from um, this equation. And um, the gain is the H here. And so for high SNRs, we do not attenuate a spectral component. And for low SNRs, we do attenuate it. That's exactly this function here. So that's, I guess, quite clear. And now the a priori and a posteriori SNR play a central role in computing all these different gain functions. So the definition of the a priori SNR is the ratio of the power spectral densities of, of the clean signal um, um, over the power spectral density of the noisy uh, of the noise of the noise. So there's a signal to no noise ratio in each frequency bin or each frequency. So this is uh, like a continuous frequency uh, definition. Or if you compute it based on um, the DFT and a periodogram, for example, then you would simply define it as the, the statistical expectation over the magnitude squared uh, Fourier coefficients. So here again of this clean sp signal and here of the noise signal. So that's the a priori SNR. And obviously, um, we don't know phi SS. If we would know phi SS, um, then um, our job would be done already, and we don't need to continue, but we don't know it. So this a priori SNR is a quantity that's given, or you have to estimate it. And that's uh, the next step. In order to estimate it, we also introduce another quantity, which is called the a posteriori SNR, which is Rama of mu and L. 
And now here we plug in the magnitude squared Fourier coefficient of the noisy signal. So this is clearly available because that's a microphone signal that is measurable. And um, we relate it to the power spectral density of the noise. So this is a quantity that's a bit better um, uh, to estimate than the a priori SNR because the numerator is clearly given or measurable and um, the denominator must be es estimated. And there's a nice compact relation between the two. So if you subtract one of the a posteriori SNR and you take the statistical expectation, then you get the a priori SNR. So if you have the a posteriori SNR and do some averaging, statistical averaging, we can compute or estimate the other SNR as well. Also, this a posteriori SNR has some nice um, statistical properties, um, um, like a periodogram. It's exponentially distributed. Um, so here is the distribution. It's maybe not that important to go much into this detail, but it's important once you want to set up, for example, a voice activity detector based on this quantity, then you have to look at the distribution as well. So here is the exponential distribution, which can be written with the uh, variances of the speech and the noise signal or with the SNR, uh, the Xi um, value. Um, also, we note that um, the um, maximum um, likelihood estimator of Xi, of the a priori SNR. You can see here in the distribution of gamma, Xi is a parameter. And now you can um, maximize the likelihood um, of Xi, which um, is simply maximizing this, um, the, um, this density. And um, then you find that the maximum likelihood estimator of Xi is simply gamma minus one. So it's this term here, except that you don't have to compute in expectations. So gamma minus one is the maximum likelihood estimate under Gaussian assumption, I should always add. Uh, so if you assume that your um, signal your Fourier coefficients are Gaussian distributed, complex Gaussian distributed. Um, this version here of this estimator, so that would give us a first estimator that we could then plug in to our Wiener filter. And then we would have here uh, the gain function for the Wiener filter and we would be done. But it turns out that this estimator is, estimate is very noisy. So if you uh, plug this in as it is, um, your gain function will fluctuate like crazy and will give you a lot of artifacts in the process signal. Um, so uh, a better way is use what is called the decision directed a priori estimator, um, SNR estimator. Um, which uses, in fact, this maximum likelihood estimator, weights it by 1 minus alpha, limits it, um, and uh, combines it with the best signal estimate from the previous frame. So this is frame L, the new information, the new maximum likelihood estimate, and then you take your the output of your enhancement system, so the S hat, um, um, value from the previous frame, L minus 1. You take the magnitude squared of it and you relate it to your noise estimate of the previous frame. So this is also a signal-to-noise ratio weighted by alpha. So you combine these two estimates like a recursive estimate and a new one. And this gives you the uh, um, new and smooth um, a priori signal-to-noise ratio estimate. This is the celebrated decision-directed uh, a priori SNR estimation also um, developed by um, Ephraim and uh, Mala. And um, here is a demonstration of the differences. So here is a spectrogram of a clean signal. Here is um, the noisy signal, with some, so the clean signal with some babble noise. And here is what you get when you use the um, maximum likelihood estimator, what you find is a fairly good reproduction of your target signal, but lots of white spots here in your spectrogram, and all these correspond to a short-time um, artifact. And now if you imagine that you have maybe one peak here somewhere in the time frequency plane and you resynthesize your time domain signal, essentially it means when you have here um, a lonely peak somewhere, that you will, in the inverse DFT, 
you will generate a sinusoidal signal as the output because you um, uh, excite or have a value at one frequency in one frequency bin. Now, if you compute uh, the inverse DFT, it will give you a sinusoidal output, and that will sound not very natural. So by having these random excitations here all over the place, you will get a mixture of um, sinusoidal uh, artifacts, which is known as uh, musical noise, and I will have a demonstration later on. Now, if you plug in this decision-directed estimator and now watch this um, rightmost um, um, spectrogram, um, this picture looks quite uh, different. Now also the speech information is um, mostly present, but all these little um, artifacts from the uh, maximum likelihood estimate are gone. At least many of them are gone, and only some are left, and um, they are much less annoying than um, this one here. So this musical noise problem was a problem that was driving people crazy for many years um, because all the algorithms were essentially nice to publish a paper, but um, they were not usable in practice uh, because people would not like to listen to um, these artifacts all the time. Okay, um, another algorithm I like to mention is the spectral subtraction. Um, dates back to Boll, um, 1979. This was one of the first uh, attempts to uh, uh, produce an enhanced uh, audio signal or speech signal. So here the idea simply is that um, you take the power spectral density of the noisy signal and you subtract um, the power spectral density of the noise, and that should give you, in theory, um, the power spectral density of the clean signal. And that can be used then to um, create a filter. Um, as shown here in the second line, you can simply extract here the uh, power spectral density of the noisy signal, and then you end up with this term, and that is like a filter function that is, or filter gain that is multiplicatively applied to your power spectrum of the input signal. And there are many variations of it. It's also related to the Wiener filter. It's simply the square root of the Wiener filter, and it has been generalized with different co uh, exponents here um, to make it a bit more flexible and to adapt it to certain noise types, etc. Okay. Um, then there's a whole group of nonlinear estimators, um, which... Um, use the basic assumption that uh, speech is at least short time stationary, even though it's never really stationary. At least this assumption <laughs> makes it um, manageable. Um, the noise is additive, and speech and noise are uncorrelated. And now you can develop all kinds of estimators um, for either the complex Fourier coefficients, so you have to estimate the real and the imaginary part, or the phase, or the magnitude and the phase, um, or you estimate the amplitude, only the amplitude, which has been also very um, common um, to do just amplitude estimation um, because um, um, it is believed, I should say, that there's not so much information in the phase, but currently also people are working a lot on phase estimation. Um, so things change from time to time. And then you can use different optimization criteria, for example, minimum mean square error optimization or maximum a posteriori optimization, and then you end up with these um, um, optimization rules which uh, tell you how to compute, uh, for example, the complex coefficients given the noisy coefficients. Um, the most famous one is probably um, the spectral amplitude estimator that was developed by Efrain Mala um, um, almost 30 years ago I, um, now. Um, where you would estimate, um, or, or they develop a minimum mean square estimator for the amplitude. So here are the clean speech amplitudes, spectral amplitudes, here are the no, uh, estimated amplitudes, and then this is minimized under a Gaussian model, um, which essentially means that you have to solve an integral like this, and, and there's also a way to write it in a uh, more friendly form using Bayes' theorem uh, at this point, and um, there's also a closed form solution, um, which is shown here, um, which uh, uses some special functions, but essentially is computable also in MATLAB. Um, and if you want to implement it in a device, you would tabulate these functions and then read out the values from the um, functions. So this is a nonlinear approach. And um, there are 
ah, okay, here is the gain function, um, now plotted as a function of the a priori SNR and the a posteriori SNR, because both are uh, play a role here in this um, uh, computational rule. And essentially what you find is when the SNR becomes lower, then also the gain is reduced, which we already saw for the Wiener filter, which is a bit counterintuitive is the behavior for the a posteriori SNR, because here if the a posteriori SNR goes up, which signals, in fact, that there should be a target signal available, the gain also goes down quite a bit, um, and that's a bit counterintuitive, but the result of this um, uh, minimum mean square estimation, and this contributes, in fact, quite a bit to the success of this estimator, because this is a way that um, this feature suppresses the fluctuations in the output, so whenever um, there is um, a fluctuation in the output, it's a bit suppressed, and that smooths out the signal and does not, or leads to less musical noise. Then there is a famous log spectral magnitude estimator um, where you would use a log weighting on the amplitude so to mimic or um, use a function that's more closely related to um, our uh, loudness perceptions. Um, and that is also quite popular to use uh, such a weighting, a log weighting, for example, for example, on the amplitudes and then do again the minimum mean square estimation. There's also a closed form solution uh, that can be computed also with MATLAB fairly easily, easily and um, is also very popular um, in certain applications. Okay, so here's an audio demonstration. Um, I realize that um, the target signal is in German, so I apologize for it, but um, you probably can get uh, um, most of the effects. Um, so here's the noisy input signal. Now, the output after spectral subtraction. So the target signal is fairly clear, but uh, in the background you hear the typical musical noise of speech enhancement algorithms, and it's very clear that nobody would buy this. Um, that is uh, not a signal you like to listen to uh, over a longer period. Now, the minimum mean square short time amplitude estimator from Ephraim Mala. Um, which clearly gives you a much better background um, or residual noise quality, more or less a white, with a white character, but still with some uh, um, characteristics of the original noise. And the uh, Log spectral estimator achieves a bit more of noise suppression, but also introduces a bit more of target signal distortions. Okay, so again the original. Okay, so that was a demonstration of musical noise and what these um, um, established estimators can do. Um, some years ago, not so many years ago, we um, then generalized these methods um, and found a very general solution that is very flexible. Again, a minimum mean square error solution where we minimize an error criterion and uh, we made it more flexible in two ways. Uh, one, we um, abandoned the Gaussian assumption because, in fact, Fourier coefficients are not, of speech are not Gaussian, even though um, you can read this in, um, in a lot of uh, books or papers, uh, but they are only Gaussian if, um, or the argument uh, that is often cited is the central limit theorem. They say, well, in, when you compute the Fourier transform, the DFT of a signal, you essentially sum over a lot of uh, signal samples, and whenever you... Um, uh, sum up um, independent, statistically independent signal samples, then um, um, the re resulting probability density will converge uh, to a Gaussian. And that is a frequently cited argument, and, um, but 
nobody uh, cared to really uh, measure a histogram or look at uh, the true uh, distribution. But what we found is indeed that uh, it's not Gaussian because simply these uh, signal samples are not uncorrelated or um, um, independent. And uh, the Fourier transforms that we use here in these kind of applications um, are much shorter than the span of correlation in the signal. For example, if you consider a vowel, a vowel can be easily 200, 300 milliseconds um, in uh, duration. Um, and your Fourier transform is maybe only 20 milliseconds. So um, essentially you see a highly correlated signal in your um, transform. And that means that um, the distribution uh, is uh, more or less the distribution of your time domain signal. And it's, um, the, in the time domain signal it's already well, was already well known that speech is not Gaussian but has a peaky distribution, a super Gaussian distribution. So here for the amplitudes we then use uh, parametric distribution, the key distribution for the speech amplitudes, uh, which has a design parameter where you can um, control it a bit to be Gaussian, super Gaussian, or sub Gaussian. Uh, so this is called the shape parameter. And um, we have um, as a second um, parameter to control a compression exponent, a beta, uh, the compression parameter here, where uh, which we use here in the exponent of the amplitudes. And again here, some illustration. The density allows us to modify it from Gaussian to super Gaussian, sub Gaussian, depending on this um, parameter um, delta. Um, so here is a Rayleigh density in black. That's the Gaussian case. And then we can um, make it more peaky or less peaky and uh, adapt it to the true distribution of speech. Um, and we can introduce some compression, so especially for beta smaller than one, um, this function will act as a compression, like a square root compression or higher um, compression. Um, but we could also uh, design it as an expansion, but that's um, never used. So we really leave it as um, use it for a compression. And again, there is a closed form solution for all the integrals that you have to solve. And you need, again, special functions that can be seen in the paper, uh, especially this confluent hypergeometric function. But then um, you have a very flexible gain rule that can be adapted um, to your problem. And this gain rule, in fact, uh, summarizes um, all or many, many other older uh, special cases like the short time amplitude estimator from Ephraim Mala is found here for a Gaussian signal, so delta being one and beta being one, no compression. And um, the log um, spectral amplitude estimator is also here, the limiting case. And essentially, you can move all around in this um, pink um, region. And um, we found that a good working point is this one here, uh, where you have a square root compression, and you have some super Gaussian assumption about the distribution of speech, so the delta being 0.5. So this has been found to be a, a good operating point where you get a good trade-off about noise reduction and uh, distortions and so on. Um, yes, listening tests and, and uh, measures um, as well. But in the end, um, so you don't find in my presentation a lot of um, uh, objective measurements. Um, of course, we do that in, the, in terms of various measures. But I clearly want to point out in the end, uh, listening is the one measure. Um, so um, there's no way around about no way around of uh, listening experiments, listening tests, and that is really important. Also to listen. Um, whenever you process your results, to listen to it and to be very critical about the target quality, the background quality, and uh, possible artifacts. Okay. Um, I've um, pointed out earlier that uh, one of the important ingredients to a noise um, reduction algorithms is noise power spectral density estimation. Because once you have the noise power spectral density estimation, you can estimate the signal-to-noise ratio. When you have the signal-to-noise ratio in each time frequency bin, you can compute the Wiener filter or any of the other uh, estimators, and then you have solved the problem more or less. 
Um, there are many different methods around for noise power spectral density estimation, uh, like using a voice activity detector, so detect um, periods of speech pause, then collect the noise statistics during that time and use it later on. Um, there's some kind of soft decision methods where you don't make hard decisions on voice, on non-voice activity, but you use a probability measure. Um, there is a method called uh, tracking of spectral minima, which I will explain, and there are some more recent methods which uh, use minimum mean square error estimation also for estimating the noise power. The assumptions for these methods are always that you... Uh, that speech and noise are statistically independent um, and speech should not always be present, otherwise most of these approaches will go haywire somewhere. Uh, noise is more stationary than speech is also one of the uh, crucial assumptions. So the worst case for all these algorithms is an interfering signal which is simply a second speaker. That is always the worst case. Um, because that's then it's very hard to tell apart which is the target and which is the interfering speech. Um, just some ideas of how voice activity detectors work. I also don't go much into detail here, but I want to point out a certain aspect. Um, so typically they use some features, um, uh, use a subband power, um, have some pitch detector, and um, also uh, use, um, the, for example, correlation of uh, your signal segments um, over time. Then they form a decision um, based on these features. Um, they also most often use a background noise estimate and also have a scheme to um, yeah, what's called a VAD hangover addition to make sure that at the end of words you don't clip um, your signal but you have give it a sufficient time uh, before you decide on non-speech. Um, here is the performance of one of these um, estimators, that is in, um, voice activity detectors, which is in fact a standardized uh, voice activity detector uh, from the uh, mobile phones uh, world, GSM, um, the adaptive multi-rate codec. And you see here at 30 dB, they, it works perfect, or well, this is like an initialization artifact here, but uh, this here is um, found uh, very nicely. Um, so it works perfect, has some hangover built in, uh, so not to harm the um, trailing edges of uh, speech sounds. Um, but then at zero dB, it more or less decides all the time on, um, on speech. It still works here quite well, but uh, for example here, it decides on speech, and for this type of application, that's a good way to do it because this voice activity as, um, detector is used for what we call a discontinuous tr transmission in, uh, in, in mobile phones uh, where you don't want to transmit the signal all the time, especially if nobody is talking. That's also a, a measure to improve the battery life of your mobile phone. So you only transmit when um, somebody is speaking and otherwise not, and, uh, but you want to make sure that even under noisy conditions um, you don't lose speech because that would be very annoying for the conversation if your mobile phone would not transmit speech. So here this is tuned such that you would transmit um, and, and uh, would try to avoid um, um, missed hits or missed classification results. This is another estimator which is more selective. It's based on the a posteriori SNR by comparing this SNR with a threshold. You can build a very powerful and simple uh, voice activity detector, which is a bit more selective, as you can see, but then also um, uh, might miss some of the soft speech sounds when they are drowned in heavy noise. So the message really is whenever you use a voice activity detector, just don't take any one because voice activity detectors need to be optimized for the application. So this one could be, for example, used for noise estimation because it allows you also to pick out some noise in between the words, um, but um, could also introduce some artifacts in other applications. So that is the important message. Voice activity detection is always tuned for some application and you have to be careful when you pick out one algorithm. Um, 
When it comes to noise estimation itself, um, you in fact don't need to do a voice activity detection because um, you don't want to detect noise or non uh, speech or non speech activity. What you want to have is a noise estimate. And um, this is realized by this minimum statistics method where you um, again assume that uh, the power or the variances of speech and noise are additive. Then you do this recursive smoothing of the periodogram. We have seen this before. Then you search for um, the minimum the minimum of the smooth power within a finite window of length d. And then you assume that your minimum is somewhat representative of the true noise power. Um, and we see this in an animation here. Uh, so this is a time here, so the frame index time of a noisy, um, uh, several noisy sentences in uh, time varying noise at one certain frequency at uh, frequency bin 25, that's so in the lower frequency range. And um, now this method first smooths out this periodogram. So we get the blue curve, which is a, it's not so much fluctuating, it has a lower variance. And then we um, move across uh, the lower edge of this blue curve and find the minimum. And the minimum is then an initial estimate for the noise power. But you can clearly see that there's still something missing here. Um, the mean here, for example, during speech course is uh, still a bit higher than the minimum, and that needs to be compensated. This is on one bin, on bin 25. In this. Yes, on every bin. This is done on every bin. Um, and this obviously doesn't require any voice activity detection. That's a continuous process. You simply go for the lower edge. Um, so, the, But there's still a mismatch, or you can say a bias, between the red estimate and the true power, which is obviously caused by taking the minimum. The minimum is always smaller than the mean, or in the best case, equal to the mean. Um, so this is shown here in uh, terms of probability distributions and can be computed. So here is a probability distribution of the smooth histogram, and this is a distribution of the minimum, which can be computed under some circumstances, some assumptions. And then you can compensate for the bias that you have. And once you do this um, you, and do some other in smaller enhancements, you get then this result here shown. Um, in red, again, where you can clearly see now that you match the mean here of the, your noise power and you're even follow, able to follow uh, time-varying fluctuations. Uh, so here, a decrease in the noise power here, an increase even during speech activity, you can follow um, the noise power um, to some extent. Um, and that gives a much better noise estimate um, for your enhancement system. And the noise estimates turns out to be a very crucial thing. If the noise estimate is not good, your system will not deliver a good um, output uh, performance. And you don't need, once more, you don't need the voice activity detector for this continuous process. Okay, so um, that was a very quick overview on estimators for single channel enhancement. And now to conclude this single chapter on single channel stuff, um, I have one more addition, and that's again about musical noise, because musical noise is um, the, the biggest problem that people were facing, even if they had all these nice estimators. Um, and you have to do something about it if you want to sell your product in the end. And uh, um, many people said, well, the single channel enhancement will never work, um, simply because of that musical noise problem. but um, and now there are solutions available which um, more or less get rid of this problem. Um, okay, so this illustration is just um, to uh, my graphical uh, imagination of how it so sounds. Um, okay, so what's the trick here? Um, what we do here is a processing step in the Capstrom domain. And I like to briefly remind you what the Capstrom is. It's a... Um, an um, often used concept, especially also in speech recognition in the uh, famous Mel frequency capstrom coefficients. So the capstrom um, is the uh, inverse Fourier transform of the magnitude spectrum 
after taking the log function. So you first take the magnitude of your Fourier spectrum or your DFT coefficients, then you take the log spectrum, so a compression, again, then you take the inverse um, Fourier transform. And that was, uh, go, dates back to um, a very famous pa paper by Bogart, Healy, and Tukey. Tukey was, in fact, one of the co-inventors of the fast Fourier transform to uh, 1963. And it's a very useful concept, and I will explain why. There's also some strange um, t um, terminology attached to working in the Capstrom domain. Capstrom is an artificial word, as you uh, realize, um, uh, created by um, taking the word spectrum and uh, inversing the first half. So that's a spectrum uh, with the first half uh, turned around. And then we talk in the Capstrom domain not about frequencies, but Q frequencies. Uh, so that's frequency also with the, um, all the, 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 the F should be in red, in fact, uh, turned around. And then you don't talk about harmonics, but ramonics. And so these three guys here invented a f whole set of new vocabulary. And um, also their paper that they published um, has a very strange title. Um, but um, as, a, as pointed out, a very important paper. And the capstone is uh, very important because it uh, separates different components of speech signals, or speech spectra, I would, should say. And um, especially it enables you to extract the envelope information, um, the harmonic structure of your signal, and the fine structure of the spectrum. And why is that? How can um, this, um, this uh, simple or not so simple equation do all that for you? Um, essentially, um, you can look at it here as um, the spectrum of your signal in the dB domain. dB is nothing else than the log spectrum. And we're very used to looking at um, speech spectra in the dB, on the dB scale. And now the inverse Fourier transform is not so much different from a Fourier transform. Um, so what, essentially what it does for you is it takes this log spectrum and it computes a Fourier decomposition of this log spectrum. So essentially what it does, it looks for um, um, slowly varying components, for fast varying components. Like in a signal, when you have a time domain signal and you compute the Fourier spectrum, you get an indication of which frequencies and what type of oscillations are uh, included in your time domain signal. And here we look at the spectrum and we get information which kind of fluctuations and harmonic oscillations are in your spectrum, in your spectral representation. And here's an example. So here is the time domain waveform of a vowel. Here is the log spectrum. You can clearly see the harmonics. And now if you um, think about a Fourier decomposition of um, this um, spectral shape here, you could say, okay, I find um, a fundamental frequency here. Maybe I try to Maybe you have to half close your eyes and uh, stare to um, the screen. You find here a sinusoidal, or at least a bit of a sinusoidal wave in here, which I try to point out here. Um, and if you look at the harmonics, that could be like a fast oscillation on top of um, this uh, coarse uh, shape. And this is exactly what you now find in the capstone. So after doing this Fourier decomposition, you find strong components here um, at low frequencies corresponding to the coarse structure of your um, spectrum. Then you find this fast oscillation corresponding to the harmonics here encoded in this peak here that is uh, corresponding to the fundamental frequency. So you can use this also as a fundamental frequency estimator, and that has been proposed um, many years ago already. Here is the first ramonic, so the first harmonic of the fundamental frequency, also visible as a peak. And in between, you have all this fine structure that encodes the deviation of um, envelope of this um, true spectrum from the coarse envelope information and the harmonic. But essentially, it's a very versa versatile um, representation of your uh, speech spectrum. Now, if you do it not just for a single 
a segment of speech, but for the whole spectrogram. So here again, a, a spectrogram of a clean speech signal. Then you get this, what we call a capstrogram, um, where here again you have time on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis we have Q frequency. Um, and you find here there's a lot of information in the lower Q frequency range. That is the envelope information here. And then there's one line, not a full line, but um, some uh, pauses or interruptions here in this domain. That is the fundamental frequency. So that clearly indicates you the fundamental, the evolution of the fundamental frequency. And here you can even see the first harmonic. Um, and all this here is fine structure of your spectrum. Now this can be used now for a very specific smoothing process, which is very specifically adapted to speech. And the idea is to um, first separate um, your signal into coarse and fine spectral features, which is done by the capstrum, and then do a relatively strong smoothing on the spectral fine structure because that encodes all the little fluctuations that you find in your signal, and do no or just a little bit of smoothing on your coarse spectral structure because that encodes the target signal, the speech signal that you want to preserve. Um, so you can reduce the residual noise quite a bit uh, with a negligible impact on the speech signal and um, especially it's nice because it preserves the harmonic spectral structure of your voice speech segments uh, very well. And this can be applied, this method, to... Um, a lot of different um, enhancement approaches, single channel, multi-channel, blind source separation, de-reverberation, and uh, we will see this again in the hands-on session. Um, okay, here is um, um, oops. Okay, one application is you can use in the SNR estimation process, for example, for Wiener filter. Um, again, here's a standard SNR estimation using the decision-directed approach with also some outliers, which would give rise to artifacts. And here, after the capstone uh, smoothing, where this is smoothed out quite a bit and would not be uh, give rise to annoying fluctuations. And also, you can see that it has some interpolating capability. So especially in the harmonic regions here, you find that um, the harmonics are a bit restored again. And that's because we specifically look at the, this fundamental frequency, Q frequency bin, and uh, um, don't harm that or restore it uh, so that intermediate harmonics are um, uh, restored to some extent. Okay, so here's a um, quick demonstration. Again, the clean signal. Please shorten this skirt for Joyce. Uh, the noisy signal. Oops, that did not work. Why not? Please shorten this skirt for Joyce. And again, here's a noisy signal and the enhanced signal. Please shorten this skirt for Joyce. So um, what you find is um, that um, the residual noise becomes very natural. So if you uh, listen to this again uh, and focus on the residual noise, it um, sounds mostly like the original, just attenuated. Please shorten this skirt for Joyce. Very little artifacts, yeah. 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 So when it comes to hearing aids, there are several criteria. One is, of course, intelligibility. And um, the most important goal is to restore the intelligibility. Um, but the second one is also um, listener fatigue or listening effort, to reduce the listening effort and to present a quality, high-quality 
uh, output signal without artifacts. And um, there's a kind of a trade-off and a balance. And for these kind of single-channel algorithms, it is known that they don't improve the intelligibility. If they are well-designed, they also don't lower it. Here you had some slight distortions of the target signal as well. Um, but here I also went for a fairly high amount of noise reduction. Um, so if it's well-designed, um, you would more or less keep the intelligibility of the noisy signal. Um, you would not improve the intelligibility, but you would reduce the listening effort quite a bit. And the purpose of these single-channel methods in hearing aids as they are now, maybe we have a better method in uh, five years or so, is to um, get away with the noise without harming intelligibility. But it's not possible uh, for these type of methods, or at least we don't have one yet, um, to improve the intelligibility significantly. I mean, sometimes you have very small improvements, but um, it's a bit different for cochlear implants. Um, for cochlear implants, um, similar like a low bit rate speech coder, you have a um, very low bit rate interface, uh, so to say, to transmit your information. And on this interface, uh, noise is very, very harmful. So for cochlear implants, it has been shown that um, with single channel methods, um, you get an improvement of intelligibility, um, roughly by 2 dB, 1 to 2 dB. Not a lot, but significant, a significant improvement of um, statistically significant improvement. What is this 2 dB? 2 dB. Yeah. <laughs> when I mean 2 dB, I um, mean uh, signal to noise ratio in a speech reception. A test in, where you measure at the 50, typically at the 50% uh, point, and you have this kind of psychometric um, relationship between um, speech reception and SNR. Threshold, which looks often like the sigmoid, it goes uh, with the sigmoid function, and the 50% point would then be here, and um, here is the SNR. So now, in, um, so here uh, would be um, zero, and here would be 100. And um, now an improvement of 2 dB at this point means quite a lot, because that is a, could be a shift from 50 to 70%, depending on how steep this function is here at this point. So um, in this domain of uh, hearing aids, even small but consistent, of course, consistent improvements um, um, do um, contribute um, to, or can contribute to um, um, significant um, improvements in speech reception. Yes, you are always, in the end, you always um, um, have to do a, a listening test, but for, for lab evaluations or uh, intermediate evaluations uh, while you're tuning the algorithm, uh, people typically use, um, well, um, a PESC, for example, perceptual evaluation of speech quality, but uh, for the, in most cases we look at um, specifically at the distortion of the target signal, we look at um, the amount of noise reduction that we get, and there usually is a trade-off between the two. The more noise reduction, the more distortion on the target signal. Um, and we look at um, the quality of the residual noise um, and or the total quality. Um, but um, in many cases, even the simple SNR gives you some indication of uh, what your algorithm does, because most of these filters are linear phase filters, so they don't introduce much of, much of phase distortions, and then the SNR um, already gives you a good in indication.
But I, again, I like to emphasize: you have, to, in the end, you have to listen um, to the signals. Um, okay. Here is just a statistical analysis of, um, or in terms of histograms of spectral outliers, and in fact, you can show that um, uh, many of the noise reduction um, algorithms uh, produce heavy tails in the residual noise, which corresponds to these um, outliers, these random outliers, which give rise to musical noise. So here is um, um, a histogram of um, the noise power bins. Um, and you can see here the outliers, so large values, which are relatively frequent, and um, a deviation from the Rayleigh distribution, which would be like a Gaussian um, noise case. And after the temporal capstone smoothing, um, this is much reduced. The um, amount of outliers is reduced, and so musical noise is um, suppressed by this method. Okay, so... That was um, the single channel uh, part, and I uh, propose to have a quick break or some more questions, if you like. Okay. <laughs> 63. Ah, okay, that's just a floor, flooring operation on the signal-to-noise ratio. Um, if you let it, uh, you use it without this floor, again, you will have, with this uh, decision direct estimator, a lot of outliers. And yeah. so it's better to keep a certain level so that you don't have isolated peaks in your SNR estimate. Okay. Um, yeah, depends also on how much, uh, it also limits the amount of noise reduction that you can achieve. Um, so that's closely related. And um, if you put in here uh, like a minus 10 dB or 0.1 um, as a, a threshold value, then uh, you probably get a fairly good output quality, but also uh, not a lot of noise reduction or 10 dB noise reduction. Um, but um, if you go to lower values, so um, you might see too, too many outliers. So I would say a value between 0.1 and 0.15 or so, that's a value that could be used. But that's something that you need to play with, uh, depending on the application. Yeah, yeah, so um, um, the, the state of the art would be to use a um, estimator which um, allows you to um, introduce some compressive action and also to fit um, um, the a priori assumptions to the true histogram of um, true PDF of your um, clean signal and um, then um, use some method like the uh, temporal capstone smoothing to get rid of musical noise. Um, what I have to say here is these are all methods which still can be uh, implemented with the lo under the low latency constraint. So the capstone smoothing essentially does not introduce any additional latency. That is an important point to notice here. And um, that is why it's... Um, the, the, the nice ingredient um, to these algorithms because it's not introducing any latency. If you do other smoothing processes over time, then you have um, in the time domain or somehow in the spectrum domain, um, then you probably, most probably, uh, introduce some um, latency. There are some newer publications, for example, by um, the group of Deliang Wang, um, Ohio State University, where he uses like a deep neural network to estimate um, 
time frequency uh, um, segments and um, and he um, in his publication he reports um, relatively large improvements in intelligibility on single channel systems uh, for normally hearing as well as hearing impaired people um, but this process has a fairly large look ahead and um, uses um, um, uh, much longer segments of the signal in order to compute the output. So at that point, um, this would not be ready for inclusion in a hearing aid. Um, so the problem, or also say the art, is to boil it down to these low latency uh, type of um, um, system and then experience we had is that then we would not be able to improve intelligibility anymore. Um, while when you have um, all the time to process your signal, in some applications possible, like for speech recognition, you can read in larger chunks of your speech signal and do a lot of processing on it. Um, then when latency is not a problem, then you would be able to improve the intelligibility as well, with a single channel approach. One exception I mentioned is, is low bitrate systems, like low bitrate coders, where we have also shown to be able to improve the intelligibility with uh, systems like this, or cochlear implants as well, where we also had experiments in our lab uh, which showed improvements in the intelligibility. Okay, so I think we um, continue. So far, we have uh, so far we have treated uh, single channel, and now I move on to uh, multi and specifically also dual channel processing methods. And obviously, um, single channel algorithms are somewhat limited because uh, they do not allow to exploit spatial information. And also, I said this before. Um, single channel methods, at least if they are designed for the low latency uh, constraints that I mentioned, uh, do not improve intelligibility, but redu reduce the listening effort and improve the quality of the signal. Multi channel systems allow you to exploit spatial information and uh, sound field statistics and um, also here we have many, many different approaches and I can also pick out um, uh, two or three and explain them. Um, there is um, the most famous maybe delay in some beam forming and filter in some beam forming. Um, there are adaptive beam formers. There's blind source separation in various um, versions. Um, there is the multi-channel Wiener filter, so the generalization to um, uh, of the Wiener filter to multiple input signals. And um, there's also what we call a model-based adaptive beamforming approach, which I will explain in uh, more detail. But um, now, uh, since it's already late in the afternoon um, and um, you are uh, maybe a bit tired, let's do some interactive um, session um, and uh, ask the question now, suppose you have two microphones, what would you do with these two microphones? Or the two microphone signals? Any ideas? Direction of arrival as beam forming. So one keyword was um, already there. For example, you could add the two microphones signals. Simply add them, and then we would have. Um, yeah, what would we gain? Well, uh, probably depends a lot on uh, the target and the noise signals and um, the spatial properties of these, um, but um, in a situation where the noise that we receive at the microphones would be completely uncorrelated, so uncorrelated, and the target, the speaker, would be um, speaking here um, uh, from uh, the broad side of these uh, two microphones, we would gain a maximum of 3 dB. So for delay in some beam forming, if the microphone signals are, uh, if the noise components at the microphone signals are uncorrelated, you gain um, 
lock n, and n is the number of the microphones, uh, db. Um, so that is um, a useful, simple approach, but we also notice that in um, our application, like hearing aids, the microphones are often very close together. So if you look at one device, as I showed it earlier today, um, the microphones are only one centimeter apart. And that will lead to highly correlated noise signals. So a delay in some beamformer would not be very useful because it picks up more or less the same signal. The two microphones pick up more or less the same signal and then it doesn't help you a lot. So what else could we do? <laughs> Processing, technically speaking. So, yeah, perfect. Uh, um, so uh, next step would be to subtract the two signals. So what happens now? Well, if the target... Hmm? Um, if um, the target uh, comes from this direction here, it would probably be bad because then we would subtract the target signal um, at this point and we get no target at the output. That would not work. But if the target comes from this direction here, this um, could still um, work reasonably well. There would be some subtraction, some differentiating subtractive action. But um, any noise component that comes from this direction here, um, perpendicular to the axis of the two microphones, would be cancelled out. So that could be, in fact, a good approach. Um, and um, that is, in fact, used in hearing aids, and it's called differential microphones, um, where under the assumption that the, your target signal is here uh, aligned with the axis of the two microphones, and the noise source is, uh, comes from this direction, um, you get indeed um, an improvement of the signal-to-noise ratio. You need an equalization filter here at the output because of the subtraction here, which um, acts more or less like a high-pass filter, so like a differentiating system, high-pass filter. So you have to equalize for this with a low-pass filter, but then you get fairly um, decent output. And um, this also works if the microphones are closely Based. If they are just one centimeter apart, you would still uh, be able to eliminate the noise source um, that um, is here at this point, and um, as long as it is a point source. Okay, so you can get a very high gain if the noise source original originates from a single acoustic point in space, and you have no reverberation. So if you do this experiment in an anechoic chamber, you get fantastic results um, with the simple systems uh, system. But um, under more realistic conditions, you might get 3 to 6 dB of gain, but much better than for the summation or the delay in some beamformer. Um, I want to go a bit more into detail in this system. Um, so here again, we have um, the two microphones. They're closely spaced. The distance is D. And we have now the speech source, um, aligned with the axis of the microphone array. So I've turned it around now for this uh, slide here. And um, so the mechanism is as follows. We have here an acoustic delay, or we can call it sometimes the external delay. That is simply the delay of the wave fronts traveling from one microphone to the next. And we also insert an electric delay. So in, uh, in the signal path here, delay T, or sometimes called the internal delay, and then we do the subtraction here. And we can play here with the um, delay T at this point to change the characteristics of the overall system. And then again, we have the equalization filter here, which uh, uh, compensates for the subtractive, subtractive um, operation at this point. So it works with uh, closely spaced microphones. Uh, the equalizer I mentioned already. Um, simple 
implementation, implementation, but also some noise amplification at low frequencies. So you need high quality microphones to implement this, not cheap microphones. It doesn't work with cheap microphones. And um, adaptive control of the directivity pattern is possible and you get a gain, as I mentioned before, between three and six dB. And the good thing is that now you can control with this internal delay T, so the electric delay that is controllable, um, the um, uh, directivity pattern of this two microphone system. So if T is, um, uh, is zero, so no delay, then we have exactly the effect that I explained already. We can receive the signal from the front uh, without attenuation. So this is a polar pattern where this gives you the attenuation of the signal as a function of the um, uh, direction of arrival. Um, and anything perpendicular, no sources perpendicular, will be cancelled out because of the subtraction of the two microphone signals, so from here or from here. But now you can change this per internal delay and, for example, achieve such a cardioid um, pattern or um, supercardioid or hypercardioid, the different uh, directivity patterns. And for that reason, um, most hearing aids come with two microphones, which are omnidirectional, and then are combined in the hearing aid in an adaptive fashion so that different um, directivity patterns can be realized simply by software means or hardware means, but you don't need to have an extra microphone uh, for, the di uh, for the beam forming or the directivity. Um, here again is the relation of uh, um, the distance between the microphones, the speed of sound, and uh, better is a parameter that um, um, can be used instead of the internal delay T. So here's a way to compute the better from T or T from better. And um, here are typical parameters that are used to achieve certain types of um, directivities. Um, and you can see here the directivity index that gives you the improvement. It ranges between 4.7 and 6 um, dB. Um, and this all can be also made adaptive um, by uh, taking the two microphones and forming uh, the dipole characteristic and the cardioid um, characteristic, and then have um, uh, like a, a, a mix mixer, an adaptive mixer that mixes these two output signals, so you can shift this zero, this nulling action, where you can null out one of the um, uh, noise sources uh, some, um, along the back hemisphere, and um, it can be made adaptive. So if there's somewhere a noise source behind you, you can have it um, find this noise source automatically and eliminate it. It's a um, very nice and very simple approach that's also often used in hearing aids. It um, goes back to Elko and Pong, and um, they also have a patent on it. Okay, so what else can you do with two microphones? Well, um, after we did the summation and the subtraction, we could... Um, filter one of the signals and subtract it. Um, that could be um, beneficial for various reasons. And um, one typical application is what we call um, noise cancellation. So we would try to pick up with one microphone um, the noise source only and with the other one the speech source. And then we could try to estimate the noise in the primary uh, microphone here um, and subtract the, this estimated noise at this point and hopefully just have the speech here at this output. This is called noise cancellation. That's similar, for example, to echo cancellation. Someone asked me about echo cancellation uh, um, before lunch. And um, so what's the problem here? Or the, in principle, that works fine if you are able to um, find... Uh, to extract a reference noise signal. But since also, again, in our application, the microphones are closely spaced, or in the best case, maybe one on the left ear and on one on the right ear, um, the speech signal, from, which is meant just to be picked up um, by the primary microphone, will also leak into the reference microphone, and then it will also be cancelled here at this point. So 
Um, in general, in acoustic signal processing, um, even though this is a very famous um, method and has been used in biomedical engineering for compensation um, of EEG signal compensation, all kind of different applications, also echo cancellation. But in general, for these noise reduction applications, it's um, not a good idea because it's difficult to control the target signal leakage into the reference microphone. And that reduces the signal. But there's now a structure where we could combine all the different methods that we uh, have seen so far. So here we have the summation of the two microphones. So we sum the two microphones to build a first signal. Here we do the subtraction to generate a signal uh, where we cancel out um, a source that is in front of the two microphones, the target signal, in fact. So here we don't cancel out the the noise source, but we cancel out the target, which would be sitting here in front of the microphones. And then we use a filter to estimate the noise, which we see here in the upper path. So the idea is to do here some beam forming or some delay in some beam forming to generate um, a first estimate of your target signal. Uh, recall the target is supposed to sit here in front of the microphones. Here we generate a noise reference by canceling out the target. And then we have a filter here that matches the noise that we see here at this point with the noise that we have still in this signal and cancel it out at this point, and this is the output signal. And this is also a very famous approach um, known as the generalized side lobe canceller uh, by Griffiths and Jim. And... Um, uses all the different components we have um, seen so far. This generalized side loop canceller and um, also other approaches I've shown can be um, then generalized to many microphones. They are not limited to two. I've just explained it using two microphones, but it can be all generalized uh, to many microphones. Um, so here, for example, the delay in some beam former, where you just insert here some delays to cope also for other directions of arrival. Uh, and here's the summation point of um, the beamformer. Um, can be done with arbitrarily many microphones, but again, for hearing aid applications, there's a lot of, lot of space or not a lot of places where you can put these microphones. Um, so um, limited. And there's also called uh, something called the filter in some beamformer, where you insert here filters um, and um, also then can optimize these filters for maximum attenuation of noise, um, and this can also be generalized uh, to arbitrary, uh, many, arbitrary many microphones. Okay, so this is just a quick overview of what can be done in principle with the material that we have, and uh, now let's have again um, a look um, at binaural processing methods, so methods that combine the left and the right ear. And um, in, before we had this wireless link and this connectivity, the two, my, uh, to, the two hearing aids would operate completely independent and sometimes even select different programs independently, which would uh, be not a good idea. So on one ear you would have a program for, say, speech and noise, and on the other uh, music uh, listening program, and that would be, of course, very confusing for... Um, users. So, um, and I would like to present one typical algorithm that um, um, is based on um, two microphones and um, which we will also explore a bit um, in the hands-on session and um, which would then of course require this streaming capability, the streaming of audio between the left and the right side. There was also earlier this question of what the wireless link is good for. It's exactly these kind of algorithms to implement them. But then you need real-time streaming of audio between the left and the right side to do that. And um, the algorithm I would like to present is also a very classic one, um, which was initially developed for de-reverberation, so for getting rid of uh, reverberance, um, but also removes some of the noise um, 
that is frequently encountered in closed spaces where you have lots of reverb. And um, So here you find a reverberated speech signal, and you can clearly see that the signal in the spectrogram, you can clearly see that the signal is smeared out a bit. It's not that clear as um, uh, or crisp as um, the unreverberated, the, um, the dry original would look like, and it also sounds a bit reverberated. The lag is referring here to it. He may have a point in urging that death of truth be given fewer prizes. The haunted house was a hit due to outstanding audio-visual effects. So there's clearly um, reverberation. And um, the idea now is that... Um, um, the direct sound components from the speaker to the microphones, especially if the speaker is close to the microphones, will be highly correlated um, because that is more or less the same signal. But the reverberation, which um, is uh, composed of many reflections from the walls, uh, will come from all kinds of different directions, at least the late reverberation, and will be more or less uncorrelated. So again, you have here a way to distinguish between the, the desired and the undesired signal components in terms of statistical properties. One is correlated, one is uncorrelated, and that is a way to um, get rid of this. And there was a very early proposal. In fact, um, also um, uh, one of the authors is John Allen, uh, well-known Berkeley, and Blauert. Blauert um, was also from Bochum, the, or is the... Uh, Professor Emeritus in Bochum uh, from 1977, where they used the so-called magnitude squared coherence function for the suppression of uncorrelated signal components. First, uh, let's listen again to the noisy signal, and then a signal that is even some, um, or the reverberated signal, and the signal with some noise. Maybe I go to the second one directly. This is like a typical signal, um, like in a train station, uh, where you have announcements, and if you ask a hearing impaired person whether she or he understands announcements in the train stations, the typical answer is no, uh, simply because of reverb and um, all the noise. But even for normally hearing people, it's sometimes very difficult to understand um, what uh, they um, present via their PA system. Okay, here's a block diagram, and I've uh, copied it whoops, directly um, from uh, this original um, publication. Um, so here are the two uh, signals. they called X of T and Y of T. Here that um, signifies a spectral decomposition using a filter bank, or we could use our overlap at um, DFT-based um, analysis synthesis system. Then um, there's some f um, phase compensation here at this point. Um, then you add the two signals to um, get some gain, maximum of 3 dB, by um, adding or, uh, the two microphone signals. And then there's a gain applied to each of these signals. Um, and this gain, for example, um, could be based on the or is based on the correlation between the two microphone signals. And as I said before, the direct components will be highly correlated, so the gain should open up, and the uncorrelated, the late reverb, and all the ambient noise is, um, um, should be suppressed, and the gain should be designed such that these components are then suppressed in these frequency bins. And then there's, again, a synthesis filter bank um, or an overlap add system. Okay, uh, one more um, a few more words about the coherence function because the coherence function is a convenient way to compute this gain. Um, the complex coherence is nothing else than a correlation coefficient in the spectrum domain. So you go to the DFT domain. We have done this now several times. And now you compute the cross-power spectral density between the two microphone signals. So that's phi y1, y2, the cross-power spectral density, and you normalize it on the auto-power spectral densities of the first signal and the second signal. 
Um, so that's like a correlation coefficient in the spectrum domain. So you do this in each frequency bin, and then you get frequency-dependent information. That's called the coherence function. And then also very popular is a magnitude-squared coherence, the MSC. And for this, you simply take the magnitude-squared value, which then um, means that you take it in the numerator and denominator, and the nice thing about this magnitude squared coherence is, it's of course, it's a real valued function. It's not complex anymore. And it ranges between 0 and 1. So you have really a gain function that can be 0 in whenever the two signals are completely uncorrelated. And it can be 1 when they are completely correlated. And now you have really this type of gain function that you like to have to... Um, get away with those frequency bands which have only uncorrelated, so reverb and noise information, and keep those frequency bands which have highly correlated signal components which most likely then um, stem from the target speaker. Um, here is just a plot of the magnitude squared coherence for uh, diffuse noise and late reverb. Um, so um, it can be shown that for uh, a diffuse noise, which is a noise field where you receive the same uh, signal energy from all spatial directions. Um, the magnitude squared coherence looks like uh, um, a sync function or a magnitude squared sync function. And here in bl the solid line is the, the, the sync function, the model, and the dashed line is a measurement, and you can clearly see that it works fairly well, so um, you can assume that in the, when the microphones have a certain distance, then um, you um, have um, mostly uncorrelated signal components at high frequencies and some correlation at low frequencies. The further you take the microphones apart, the less correlation you see. So here it's only confined to very low frequencies. Increase the distance between the microphones. Okay, and here's what it sounds like. So the reverberated and noisy uh, original. The wagons were burning fiercely. He may have a point in urging that decadent themes be given fewer prizes. The haunted house was a hit due to outstanding audio visual effects. The process signal. The wagons were burning fiercely. He may have a point in urging that decadent themes be given fewer prizes. The haunted house was a hit due to outstanding audio visual effects. You can clearly hear that the reverberance, the reverberance has been um, significantly reduced. Also, some of the noise has been reduced. But as we can see from these um, figures here, the low frequency noise cannot be reduced because um, if it's like a diffuse noise field, um, as in this simulation or in the signal, then uh, it will be also highly correlated at low frequencies and will be passed by the system. Okay, then the final approach I would like to explain a bit is um, based on the generalized side lobe canceller, which um, I um, presented earlier, or we derived, in fact, or developed it from uh, basic components. And here is now the multi microphone version of it, uh, where we have a delay in some beam former um, to generate a first improved signal. Then we have here what we call the blocking matrix. That is, in fact, the generalization of the simple subtraction that we have seen before. The simple subtraction blocks the target because it uh, has a null or steers a null towards the target. And that can be now generalized to many microphones. And then we talk about a blocking matrix, which has a task to block out the target signal so that we have only noise signals at this point. And then we have a multi-channel adaptive noise canceller which uh, estimates the noise in this signal and subtracts it, cancels it out at this point. And um, this is a typical scenario with five microphones now, um, where you have one speaker and a second speaker, and uh, the task is to extract some noise, extract these speakers here at the output. And um, how can we do this? Oh, what I forgot to mention is that this is not a fixed system anymore, but this fully adaptive. So this estimates the position of the speakers, um, estimates this blocking matrix and the adaptive um, noise canceller, all based on posterior distributions um, um, on the um, speech activity 
of the two speakers. So that's fully online and fully adaptive. And then we can extract two, um, different, um, the two different sources. So now here's a um, quick demonstration of it. Um, speaker one, speaker two, uh, in, form, in the form of spectrograms. So one is a male, the other is a female. Um, and here is the superposition of both. So I'm speaking at the same time and also some additive noise um, um, or some noise added to the two signals. And uh, the separation now works in two steps. One is um, to localize the sources, and the second is then to extract the two different target signals. And the localization uses an approach that is based on beam forming. So we form a beam of high um, uh, sensitivity, and with this beam we scan the room or scan a certain range, and then um, try to find... Um, um, the two sources, and now if I step through um, um, the um, different directions, so here now we, the beam is indicated by this red bar here, and now if I move this around, and once I point it into the direction of speaker one, then I see the spectrogram here of speaker one, and if I continue scanning the room, then I at some point hit speaker two, and then here we see the spectral information of speaker two, and then it disappears again. And um, you also notice um, that at low frequencies, we always receive some signal, and that is because um, at low frequencies, this, um, um, there's no directivity uh, for this array. So the, the directivity depends on the aperture or the distance of the microphones in relation to the wavelengths. And so at... There's a, this is not anechoic. No, no, no. This is um, uh, this is slightly reverberant. Note. I have a demonstration uh, audio signals in a minute, and you will hear some, not a lot, not as much as in the previous example, but you hear still some reverberance. Okay, that is the SAP FAT approach. Um, maybe known, uh, but uh, um, essentially, it's acting like a beam former, and the idea is to compute a um, a measure that allows you to distinguish between, um, to measure the power that you receive in various directions. I don't go um, in the interest of time not into detail here, but explain it using this uh, figure here, where um, we now look at this example, the overlapping the two spectrograms plus additive noise here over time and over frequency in the vertical axis, and now we use that SRP FAT measure and find in each time frequency point um, the angle that maximizes this measure. And what you see here now is that there are lots of um, bluish points. I guess they are also bluish on your screen. And um, yellow points. And if you look for the angles, the corresponding angles, these are exactly the angles where the two speakers sit. So here this bluish um, color is somewhere around 60 degrees, and this yellow is maybe 110 degrees. And um, these are so-called the winning angles uh, for each, uh, in each time frequency point. So we indeed find the information um, for um, the two speakers here again um, in um, the pattern that we receive from the beam former. And now we can use a lot of different strategies to extract the two speakers. You could use build a mask, for example, for one speaker or another speaker. A binary mask would not sound that good, but still be capable to extract this. Or we can control um, this model-based generalized site loop canceler with this information. And that is the approach that we are doing, in fact. Um, so here we have a histogram of a single frame, so at a single time, we take out one slice here and look at the histogram of angles of the distribution. So we get the two peaks here for the yellow and uh, bluish um, bins. Then we fit a GMM to this, um, which gives you a stable estimate of the low position of the two speakers. And yeah, 
that's it. Um, <laughs> and um, we can uh, show then that we get some improvement uh, in terms of signal-to-noise ratios um, in comparison to a delay in some beam former, so which is um, um, the blue lines um, for two different measures, segmental intelligibility weighted signal-to-noise ratio, um, uh, interference ratio, or segmental intelligibility weighted signal-to-interference plus noise ratio the improvement. So compared to the delay in some beam former, you find some nice gain here for the system. Um, and um, it degrades a bit with increasing noise levels because then um, it's more difficult to find the two um, target sources, obviously. Now here's an audio demonstration um, with the two speakers. You can listen to them. The revolution now underway in materials handling makes this much easier. Second speaker. He did not, however, settle back into acquiescence with things as they were. Uh, the mixed signal. The revolution not, however, now underway in materials handling makes this much as they easier. And the two output signals. The revolution now underway in materials handling makes this much easier. And the other one. And the background, you still hear the, the other speaker. That is due to the reverberant um, part um, of the signal. Okay, so that brings me to my summary. Um, I've uh, shown that modern hearing systems are highly complex signal processing devices, which also have to fulfill a lot of constraints, especially latency and power. Um, the signal enhancement task is at the core um, um, of these devices because that is still the most challenging situation, adverse acoustic conditions, and to cope with these is quite difficult. Um, there are single and multi-channel um, approaches, uh, microphone array processing approaches, and source separation approaches, and there's also acoustic scene interpretation, which I have not talked about um, here, but um, that's also part of the processing in order to control the different um, options that you have available um, for processing your signal. Well, the challenge continues. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done, um, especially um, to deal or find better methods to deal with noise and reverberation and to find low complexity, low power, low latency um, implementations. And um, new solutions probably arise from better models about speech signals and hearing. Um, then the availability of sensor networks and the wireless connectivity that we have now at hand um, and <coughs> probably better models of how humans process acoustic signals in general, so top-down uh, cognitive processes that can be included. Um, some of these problems are dealt with in the project that we are currently um, working and uh, that I'm coordinating, and we have also research fellows from this project here. Um, so the ICANN here, Marie Curie Initial Training Network, where we look indeed at the modeling, the processing um, in the normal hearing and impaired auditory system. We evaluate um, the algorithms um, that are developed and we, we apply new strategies for com uh, improved communication. And a very central part of the project is that we have a common development platform for implementing these algorithms so they will be implemented in real time and so that they can be compared between labs and we have also common evaluation schemes um, which I also not talked about uh, here mostly for time constraints um, and these are the network partners um, that are in this um, network. Okay, um, a lot of these algorithms, um, or at least the older ones I presented, are also um, described in these two books, so a little advertisement at the end. And um, yeah, then I have also some references uh, compiled for, your, um, for you, and um, five pages of references um, where you find... Um, the references which I've mentioned in between on my slides um, in full uh, details. Yeah, that's it. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> so 
though I um, have made up a bit um, of time now, <laughs> we have to go to the hands-on session in, uh, in like um, 15 minutes, so yes. maybe we can make a shorter, five. yeah, start at five, yeah. And finish at seven. Yeah, yeah. You have to do okay. uh, how long you... Depends on how fast you can program. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on type. Uh, but, but don't be scared. Um, uh, it will be step by step. And in fact, you don't have to program a lot. It's just a few lines of code that we, yeah. and a few optimizations. But maybe I can give you, before we leave, an, a look now on the hands of exercise while I have the projector here. So essentially, we will implement this dual channel reverberation. Um, system, dual channel reverberation and noise reduction system. Um, and when I say we implement it, I should add it's mostly implemented already, <laughs> and you still have to add a few things. Um, so you would um, optimize or implement parts of this low delay spectral analysis synthesis system, um, the delay in some, so the summation uh, beam forming, um, then the, the gain function. And if there's still time, but that's already optional, we can also include the temporal uh, smoothing of the spectral gains um, using the technique. And um, you need to fill in a bit of code and look at the spectrograms, and most importantly, listen to the signals that you get.